Hello, my dudes. Welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis, where I like to research and discuss things relevant to social issues and media. I want to talk about home decor trends and de-influencing your mind. De-influencing is a big topic right now, especially on TikTok. Firstly, we have this overarching shift away from influencer culture. The people are getting sick of influencers constantly promoting an expensive, unrealistic lifestyle, raving about the new must-have product every single day. It's exhausting. So you'll see posts of people saying something like, don't buy this product, it's overrated. My interpretation of de-influencing is, how do we try to get influenced less? How can we be more mindful, intentional, and hopefully less wasteful, reject overconsumption? Somewhat ironically, some de-influencing posts are more like, instead of buying that, here's a cheaper alternative. Is that still influencing? Yes. I do think there's a place for honest reviews and favorites videos, but but just saying by this, not that doesn't get to the root problems, which I think is what de-influencing is really about. Anyway, obviously we can't remove ourselves from outside influence entirely, but we can practice the skill of resisting influence. We can take control of our consumption and figure out what our individual taste actually is. We can learn to make choices that align better with our style, budget, and needs instead of just buying into the trendy, popular things of the moment. So as I said, today I want to talk about all of this in the realm of home decor. I've seen so much content content in the past few years about aesthetic spaces, upgrading, replacing, redecorating, renovating. I feel like a bit of a broken record because I've been thinking and talking a lot about trend cycles lately, but we all know these super fast trend cycles are inescapable. Whether it's fast fashion, micro trends, beauty trends, I made a video recently about body trends. There are also home decor trends, of course. We did not sign up for this, but it feels impossible to opt out, right? We are constantly constantly shown messaging, ads, other people's lifestyles. You need this. This is in. This is trendy. We've seen barn doors, foam mirrors, subway tiles, neon signs, shiplap, cloud couch, all white, all gray. If you just had a visceral reaction of disgust to any of those things, ew, that's outdated. That's overdone. That's so whatever year. That's the point. These things have all at some time been hugely popular. Maybe for a few years, maybe for a brief moment. Typically, the more trendy something is, the more popular and ubiquitous it becomes, the sooner it is seen as overdone, ugly, and chuggy, if that word is even still being used. Of course, we all have our own personal taste and that's valid, but I just find it fascinating how strong our reactions can be to something that we see as simply outdated. Here's an example from the show The Watcher. The house is, by all indicators, an impeccable domestic fantasy, and its new owners had to empty their savings to afford the final price. But the family finds the house's gleaming white Italian counters so offensive so five years ago that they take out an additional loan in order to remove Move them immediately. I would love to make a video about home renovations because similarly, it is just wild to me to see people want to destroy perfectly functional things that just happen to not match their preferences. But that'll have to be saved for another time. But before we continue, this portion of today's video is sponsored by ThreadUp. ThreadUp is the world's largest online thrift and consignment store, and I am a huge fan. By this point, probably 90% of my wardrobe is from ThreadUp. I just love shopping secondhand whenever possible, and ThreadUp makes it so easy to find exactly what is on my wish list. I have found so many great pairs of pants on ThreadUp online. That's incredible. Specifically because I pay attention to the materials and the inseam. I'm a short girly. For example, I wanted black wide leg jeans, so I put in my size, color, cut, inseam, and guess what I found? Literally exactly what I wanted. They're so cozy, they fit great, they're the perfect length. These are Gap jeans. Estimated retail was $86. I got them on ThreadUp for $26.99. Another tip, I always make sure to search for my favorite brands, naturally. I get a lot of my basic tops from Aritzia brands like Babaton and Wilfred. Another little mock neck for my collection. Short sleeve, yellow mock neck. Also, ThreadUp has this feature where you could shop what I 
thrifted this time. So if you click the link in the description, it'll show you what I picked. You can click those and it'll show you similar items. And my next piece is this blank NYC teddy jacket. Estimated retail was $76. I got it on ThreadUp for $22.99. I literally recently rented this exact jacket, loved it, didn't want to buy it for the price on another website. And how lucky I find it on ThreadUp for $23. Funnily enough, I never really tried the teddy trend until recently. And obviously it's popular for a reason. So comfy, so cozy. Next piece, this sweater that you might recognize. I wore it in my last main channel video. This is a BP sweater, a little turtleneck action. I did a color analysis and they told me that I look good in like soft muted colors. So here I am, matches my claw clip. Thank you. And my last item is this Columbia fleece. I had been looking for pretty much exactly this. I love the colors. It's so cozy. I have it like tied up and cropped right now. Just a nice warm staple. Estimated retail was $73. I got it on ThreadUp for $32.99. I genuinely love ThreadUp and they are a major supporter of my channel, so much appreciated. Next time you have something on your wish list, you're shopping for clothes, click my link in the description and use code Tiffany to get an extra 35% off your first order and free shipping. Our homes can reflect a lot about our tastes and interests. They can be markers of class and wealth. Therefore, many people want to strictly control how they may be perceived. Commodities have become a means of self-expression and we are constantly incentivized to reinvent ourselves through appearances. But it's not just about how we're perceived. Our spaces can deeply impact how we feel. Especially since the start of the pandemic, we have spent more time at home than ever. Being in a messy, cluttered, unappealing space can add extra stress and make it difficult to work or relax. The ultimate goal is to have a functional space that looks and feels how you want. But that's much easier said than done. I think the influx of home tours, decor, and renovation content has really clouded our individual sense of taste, as well as our priorities. When you're constantly bombarded with what's in, what's outdated, what's trendy, what's timeless, it can be so hard to figure out what you really like and what works for you. In researching this topic and asking my Instagram followers their thoughts, I found a lot of people compare themselves to what they call influencer homes or influencer apartments. And this isn't surprising. Comparison is always hard, whether it's online or in real life. But these days we probably see more of strangers' homes online than we see of people we know. So our sense of what is normal is getting warped. So what does an influencer apartment even look like? Here's one example ideal I found on TikTok. The luxury high-rise apartment with huge windows, tons of natural light, modern appliances. It's kind of the minimalist, clean look, bright, white, gray. But to be clear, there is not just one specific type of influencer apartment. There are aspirational creators for every aesthetic. Minimalist, maximalist, cottagecore, dark academia, overflowing with plants. Regardless of which style you prefer, these creators' homes seem so perfectly designed. The point is they're aspirational. These are heavily curated spaces, and more often than not, they're very expensive to put together. It is very important to remember content creators have a big incentive to have a good looking home. For influencers, especially in the lifestyle genre, their living space is their workplace, video set, photo shoot location. It is also profitable for influencers to constantly redecorate and even to move. You can extract so much content from that. Apartment hunting, packing, moving in, shopping, redecorating, apartment tour. These are opportunities for them to create a space they love, of course, but it is also business. There's there's always that gray area with content creators, like where's the line between work and life. Some influencers promote pretty much everything they own on their Amazon storefront or other affiliate websites. That is a major incentive to buy more stuff and talk about it often. Also, as we know, some influencers get a lot of PR, free gifts, even free furniture. And as long as it's properly disclosed, I don't mind that. But that is why it is not realistic to compare yourself to these influencer apartments. In contrast, I found the term non-aesthetic apartment on TikTok. Basically, normal apartments. People show their space and are usually talking about how they want to make content, make TikToks, but they feel like their home is not cute enough. 
how can I film in a kitchen that looks like this instead of this? Some of these creators want to come to peace with the fact that their apartment may not be the cutest, most updated place, but it is functional and safe, and appreciating that can help you deal with this overwhelming decor FOMO. It is nice to have that kind of reminder. It is okay to have a normal place with normal things. And I'm not pulling the whole, oh, be grateful because some people have it worse. Social media just has a fucked up way of creating an illusion of reality that is so far removed from how the majority of folks live. And it is a privilege to be able to have the time and money to invest in creating your dream space. Though that's something I think everyone deserves a safe, comfortable home that they enjoy. I think we can all agree that the more regular regular housing representation we see online, the more we can strike a realistic balance between everyday and more aspirational stuff. So all of this is a big part of why it's important to practice resisting trends. If I spend too much time scrolling through home decor inspo, suddenly my perfectly good couch, bed, or dresser may seem bland and boring. Everything I see online looks so interesting. I definitely can't afford the original designer piece, but look, there are dupes. I can have that new table for less than $100? This is such a good deal, it would be stupid not to buy it. It's so easy to talk yourself into that. And that brings us to a big problem, perhaps the biggest in this discussion of home decor and overconsumption, fast furniture. This is from an AD article by Bailey Berg. The EPA estimates that 9 million tons of furniture are being tossed every single year. It's usually new furniture that's being tossed. It's things with cosmetic damage. Part of the problem is that fast furniture can be more challenging to repair because of its materials. It's fairly easy to sand and refinish a solid hardwood wardrobe, but something like a particle board TV stand with a laminate finish is harder, if not impossible, to repair when the surface is damaged. It's easy easier and cheaper to buy new than to fix the one you already have. These pieces aren't meant to last a lifetime. If you've ever moved out into your own place, you know that buying furniture is so hard and expensive. But brands like Ikea, Target, and Amazon make it a little easier. Free shipping! Or maybe you get a little flat pack, which are notoriously easy to put together. But really, it's the convenience, price, and availability that make fast furniture so hard to resist. So let's touch on Ikea for a minute because they're known to be like the great one-stop shop for furniture, decor, and other home goods. The prices are relatively affordable, and damn it, the meatballs are so good. When it comes to quality, some of their stuff can be great, some of it can be bad. One of my biggest complaints about most Ikea products is that... It's literally not made to last. Like on Ikea's website, they say that their particle board flat pack furniture is not made to be disassembled and reassembled, meaning it's going to be hard or impossible to move. That is just one reason why some people treat Ikea furniture as basically disposable or a means to an end. You can buy this dresser now, throw it away in a year or two, buy another one. So this problem is dual pronged. It's a production and consumption problem. Problem. There's a reason our grandparents still have the same furniture from decades ago. Goods are just not produced the way they used to be when they were made to last a lifetime. These days, the quality is worse, and our society has moved away from being a repair-centric culture to a disposable culture with basically everything. Producers are outsourcing for cheaper labor. They're using mass-produced, less sturdy materials. And as consumers, what can we do if those are the only options in our price range? Like fast fashion, most furniture is fast furniture. It's not just Ikea, Target, Urban Outfitters. Even many brands that are considered high-end still fall under this umbrella. So when it comes to the whole topic of sustainability, it it is very complicated. There is no single right answer for everyone. I know we are all working with very different budgets, access, and time to be able to deal with these kind of choices. I think the easiest way to look at it is how much are we consuming and how often are we replacing things? 
My point is definitely not to shame anyone or make you feel bad for what you've bought in the past, but hopefully we can all make some better choices in the future. But importantly, the onus for sustainable and ethical shopping should not fall entirely on the consumer. These furniture companies have a major responsibility. I would love to see more regulations, first of all, and also more circular business models to ensure that less of this furniture ends up in landfills. Whether you're moving into your first apartment or you're finally in your forever home, creating a space that feels like a true reflection of you and your values is ridiculously difficult. It's no wonder that with all the time, expense, and effort of moving, people just want to make the process as fast and cheap as possible. Again, this is why it might be tempting to just do a big Ikea run and get everything you need all at once. But please resist the urge. I know you want to feel settled ASAP. I've been there. But by rushing the process of shopping, you'll likely buy a bunch of stuff that you don't even like or that's going to feel outdated within a year or two, and then you're going to have to shop more. Start with a few basic bits of furniture that you need to function. I've been playing The Sims like way too much lately, so my brain is melted. <laughs> I keep imagining Lil Simsy playing Rags to Riches with Stanley. If you know, you know. All you need is a bed, toilet, and a fridge. But really, as long as you have like the bare essentials, you can afford to take a little bit more time, even a few more weeks to work on decor. Being patient and collecting stuff slowly is great for many reasons. First of all, you don't have to spend a ton of money all at once, which is nice. Second, you can take a lot more time to compare your options and prices. And third, Third, buying one piece at a time really helps to keep everything more cohesive. One of my Instagram followers recommended keeping most of your big furniture pieces pretty neutral to your taste, whatever that means. Ideally, pieces that can be a staple and grow and change with you over the next few years. Then you can use smaller, interchangeable things like pillow covers, blankets, art, and lighting to bring color and personality to the space. These little touches are so much more attainable and inexpensive for switching up design trends, and they're a great way to figure out what actually speaks to you. When you're craving a change, you can always rearrange your furniture and then swap out those little bits of decor seasonally. Trick your brain into thinking, this is new. And of course, I highly recommend shopping secondhand whenever you can. There is so much stuff that already exists. I love buy nothing groups, Facebook Marketplace. If you're lucky, you might be able to get great hand-me-down pieces from family or even find absolute gems for free on the street. The inherent local community element just brings me so much joy. But what I love about secondhand stuff is that it's often so much more fun and unique. These pieces might need a little bit of TLC, a little bit of maintenance, but they can stay in your life forever. Here's a fun little secondhand success story. My co-writer Sheridan was on the hunt for a credenza for years. One day, the perfect piece popped up on OfferUp, a gorgeous 1960s hardwood credenza at a realistic price. And Sheridan said that she's just so glad that she was able to wait, resist the urge to just go to Ikea, because now she has what she considers a forever piece, a really high quality, lovely piece of furniture that comes with a whole backstory. I don't have that magical of a story, but here's my example. I have this shelf, which is Ikea, but I bought it secondhand on Facebook Marketplace. This was my first DIY attempt with some spray paint. It was a fun process, and I love that this brings some bright color to my office. At first, honestly, I painted it, and I was like, did I make a mistake? Is this color hideous? But then I remembered that this is my laptop cover. So it actually matches great, no regrets. Now I will say I know that a big barrier when it comes to getting secondhand furniture is the whole transportation issue. Some people are lucky to have loved ones around who have a van or a truck who are able to help them move, but others live alone or can't physically move furniture. So I understand that it might not always be feasible to go buy vintage or pick something up from Facebook Marketplace. It is a lot more work than just having something delivered straight to your door. But if you are ever able to, I think it's so worth it. I highly recommend just renting a U-Haul van or truck. The cost actually might shake out, especially if you're getting a great piece of furniture for free or very low cost. Okay, so final thoughts. Overall, I think the best thing that we can all do is use what you have, use what already exists, 
if you buy new, just try to make the best use of it. Keep it as long as you can, take care of it. And whenever you're done with your stuff, make the effort to try to find a new home for it, either by reselling or giving it away. And I have some last points. Number one, sometimes we've just got to accept that some things are not the cutest, but pay attention to function versus aesthetic. Like, are these the greatest possible pieces? No, but they do the job, so I don't feel compelled to replace them anytime soon. Second, you do not need one cohesive aesthetic. You don't need to label your style. I think online we feel compelled to be like, what am I? Have I taken a thousand style quizzes for what apartment decor I have? Yeah, who knows? For me personally, it doesn't really matter. And also shopping mindfully or trying to avoid these short-term trends does not mean that your space has to be boring. You can have all of the eclectic, weird, funky little items you want. Number three, when you are shopping, I'm a huge fan, as I mentioned, of a wish list. If you find something you like, one of those de-influencing TikToks tells you something that you might want to buy in the future. Don't buy it right away. Give yourself a waiting period, at least a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months. Make a little Pinterest board make a list. Spend more time enjoying the dreaming part of shopping, the imagination. And then eventually down the line, when you actually need the thing, you can revisit that list and go, you know what? It's time. And number four, try to find those long-term forever items. Through your life, as you hopefully earn more money and you develop your taste, this is when you can save up to buy your more forever pieces. Forever items don't have to be literal, obviously, but ideally something you could see yourself keeping for like five or more years, start with that, which to young people that feels like forever. And of course, your forever pieces don't have to be huge, expensive investments necessarily. They can just be the precious things that you've collected over your years. Pieces you've made. A couple of my friends have done woodworking recently. I have a couple little pottery dishes. I always find the cute little bits of personal touches to be my favorite parts of anyone's home. It doesn't have to be trendy or aesthetic. It can just be a little bit of you. That's a bit of me. Love Island popped out. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. Please send me a comment if you're watching to the end. Send me a comment of a trend you resisted that you're glad that you didn't buy. Something you waited a long time for that was satisfying. Or an item in your place that feels the most you. I bet you all have very cute answers and I just want to hear. And another thank you to ThreadUp for sponsoring today's video. You can click the link in the description and use my code Tiffany to get an extra 35% off your first order and free shipping. Thank you, Thread up. And lastly, shout out to my patrons. I have a Patreon where I make a bonus video every month. We do a monthly live stream. You can see some behind the scenes, how these videos come to fruition, more about what's going on in my brain. <laughs> and extra thank yous to my executive producer tier. We have Uwu Face, Abby Hayden, Eric Danielson, Freshly Laundered, Jackie King, Jill Hoffman, Julie Leva, Matthew Gray, Megan Collins, Megcat33, Nicole Louise, Sarah Kemi, Stevie May, Tom Walker, Treffa, and VivianOladon.com. Thank you so much for being patrons. All right, that is all. Stay tuned for more future internet analysis videos. If you didn't watch my last video, I will plug it now. It's about Mr. Beast. Yes, the Mr. Beast fans had some beef with me. You know, I'm being a little critical of the concept of charity, especially charity for content, but I think I was quite fair. So check it out and let me know what you think. Okay, thanks. Bye.